Hey, good morning, people. Uh, I do want to apologize for the confusion yesterday. I got up early, was went ahead, built a lesson for you, got on screencast, uh, talked through everything I thought I was, you needed to know for it that you couldn't get just by reading this thing. And it still has not uploaded. It's it's ridiculous. So I moved my operations to here at uh, the school with hopes of it working. I just did my Ag Power class first period. Seems to be working good. But um, I tried everything. I, yesterday I went to YouTube and it said processing for like six hours. I was getting very, very frustrated and... Uh, I feel like I kind of let you all down. But anyway, uh, screencast wise, all of these are inaccessible. Um, so I don't know. Anyhow, uh, pushing these out to YouTube seems to be the best option. So that's going to be my method of operation moving forward until uh, screencast gets their stuff together. But it's a learning process. So I'm sorry if I held you up yesterday, if you had dedicated nine to 10 to do some work uh, in ag structures and design didn't get to it. Um, I put the notes out there yesterday on fencing. I want to try and be as brief as possible just because the longer these videos are, I think the longer they take to upload. So, um, real quick yesterday, uh, or let's talk about today, I guess. So you guys sheet here, I'll make that day two and we'll make it the 19th and on your sheet here. Flashback. I just want to know three reasons why we install fence. I'm going to go through some things here on the screencast. I want you to put those in your notes, please. And then you're going to answer these nine questions for me, if you would. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, just real briefly, yesterday we talked about fencing as a method of protecting your property, creating a barrier between uh, you and the outside world. We talked about outlining property. So not only is it a barrier, but we can see where this property line is, confining animals, um, excluding animals. So in this situation here, we are keeping deer out of a vineyard. Uh, this could also be people out of a certain crop area. Um, enhancing appearance, very, very popular amongst horse farms to do so. Stone walls were a big thing. And then residentially. We do so. We talked about different types of fencing, barbed wire, um, and how Joseph Glidden patented that back in the 1800s. Woven wire invented by a guy named Page. Um, and we have fixed knot, and then we have twist knot. Talked about how wire gauge varies. The larger the number, the smaller the wire. So 20 gauge is going to be much smaller than 9 gauge. Um, woven wire depends varies based on the box size. So this rectangle is going to be different than these squares here. Um, high tinsel woven wire, tinsel being pulling force. Like when we talk about welds, we can pull this wire um, extreme amount and it's going to stay nice and tight. Essentially high tinsel wire, spring steel. Um, and if that something were to fall on this high tinsel fence, it typically will bounce back. Another type of woven wire that we see um, is equine woven wire and there's no climb mesh, which is these small rectangles and then double diamond, which is these V shaped. So essentially you got the, the run through yesterday. We moved through electric wire. We talked about how it can be temporary and then rail fence, which, um, we have the plank rail PVC or vinyl and then round ranch rail. I will, whenever that thing decides to work, get that posted up for you to go back and watch if you want. Um, today, again, going to be brief. We're going to talk about fencing installation. So, um, first thing that we have to determine if we're installing fence is what type of posts are we going to use. And most of the time, when we talk about ag fence and we talk about installing barbed wire, woven wire, it's going to be a combination of two. Now, this isn't always the case, but it seems to be the most common uh, thing. So what we've got are pressure treated posts. Pressure treated posts are made of pine. Um, softwoods conifers are the only type of post that can be pressure treated. We can salt treat hardwood lumber, but uh, by law in Kentucky, we can only pressure treat pine. 
Um, so pressure treating, as we saw when we went through different types of lumber, they put it into a sealed container, they apply a chemical, and then through heat and pressure, they force that chemical into the wood and it resists rot and it also resists um, suppression from insects. So these pressure treated posts here, um, the most common is just gonna be a round post. They're sold by diameter. So four inch is typically the smallest that you can buy and they go up to a 12 inch post. When we talk about starting the, the fence installation process, we'll talk about when we might use an eight or 12 inch post. Uh, you can see that this post here in the middle has a flat face on it and that's called a faced post. If that you were going to put up a rail fence or you wanted easy nail driving, you might use a faced post post um, in order to have this nice flat surface to put the fence rails on or let the wire rest on. The other post over here, this square one, I'll move my, my screen out of the way. That's actually cedar and cedar naturally resists rot and it also naturally resists insect suppression. So if uh, you don't want pressure treated posts, you can use cedar. Miss um, Myers, who works at the castle up in Versailles, she was putting up a fence in her garden and one of the organic stipulations because of the chemicals that are used in pressure treated posts is that you have to use cedar. Um, they just didn't want any of that leaching that the, the chemical they use for pressure treated posts is arsenic. They didn't want that leaching into the vegetables that were going to be uh, sold to people organically. So you have to use cedar for organic applications. It's just one of those rules that they have. Um, cedar posts are very expensive. They can be double the price of a pressure treated pine post. As a side note, Lowe's typically doesn't sell pressure treated posts, but um, I have seen some farmers get some good deals on 4 by 4 So those were the lumber dimensions that we use for the base of the garden shed that we built. And uh, those 4 by 4s work very well as fence posts. They're typically strong. They're typically, typically don't warp. Um, so, you know, when you're assessing costs, if that round fence posts are not in your budget it might be worth checking what the price is at Lowe's. The lumber at the lumber yard fluctuates so much in price that you can actually get a pretty good deal sometimes on um, on four by fours and use them for fence posts. An interesting thing that was developed in the early 2000s was a plastic post and a plastic fence post was um, primarily made of recycled uh, components and they just mold these things into a solid plastic rod eight feet long and the diameter is typically around five inches and they claim that they will last 500 years obviously there's no way to test that um, because we don't know what 500 years of, of wear and tear is going to look like but they they have simulated tests in labs um, I have a neighbor who's put up some fence with these they were actually pretty affordable when they first came out. They were like $10 a post compared to a four inch or five inch wood post that was about $4.50 or $6. And the idea is you never have to replace them again. So to pay double what you would a wood post didn't seem too bad. These pressure treated wood posts will last about 15 years, maybe 20 years, depending upon the quality of the post that you got and the diameter, the bigger the post the harder it is for them to break down. Um, now these plastic posts have kind of priced themselves out of the market. They're $20 and higher. Um, and it's hard for a farmer to justify paying that when it comes to making that investment. So something that I want you to be aware of, they can be purchased, they're just very costly. Um, metal posts most commonly come in the form of a T-post or pipe. So we've got this T-post. A lot of people think they're called T-posts because at the bottom here, they've got this uh, wedge that functions as going into the soil and limits the removal. Um, it's not actually so. If you took a T-post and you looked at it on the end, it has a T-shape. So we've got the vertical and we've got the horizontal going across the top. That structure keeps it from just bending and flopping over and it doesn't have to be the solid fixture. So um, that's the T-post there. 
Some ranchers out west actually just buy metal pipe, uh, thick wall stuff like three eight or like uh, three sixteenths or quarter inch, and they jam it into the ground, or they'll concrete it into the ground, and um, it works. My wife's uncle up in uh, Alberta, that's what he uses to string up barbed wire. Barbed wire. He welds uh, two wings on the bottom of the post, and then he just jams them into the ground and wires on the barbed wire and he doesn't have to worry about post rotting um, or them folding over in high winds they're kind of tried and true just there but um, they are going to be i don't know cost wise it's probably going to be a little more expensive than wood they're going to be easier to put in because we can when we talk about installation um, you're not trying to jam this four or six inch solid uh solid component into the ground you're just taking this little two inch um fixture and jamming it in there so that's that post spacing when we talk about putting fence posts in as you look back at some of these um at, at some of the pictures from yesterday most of the time that spacing is going to vary between eight and 16 feet apart you can't see the feet because of the, the camera there uh, but that depends upon the application. So um, if we're putting up rail fence, most of those boards are going to come 16 feet and we need a board in the middle on those. Um, so we're going to space those posts eight feet. If it's going to be a high pressure area with livestock, like this is a uh, collection pen or a corral, we're going to want to space those posts at eight feet. If it's just boundary fence, perimeter fence, dividing fence, and we're using a high tensile wire, we could get away with a 16 foot spacing on posts. Um, when we talk about installation, we will discuss the use of wooden posts and metal posts, but sometimes we'll go 40 feet uh, in between our wooden posts and then we'll use metal posts uh, to stabilize. So this application is pretty standard. I think this is a uh, 12 foot on center when it comes to that fixed knot high tensile. Um, you can see here, we've got 10 feet on center and we've got three metal posts. Sometimes farmers will utilize only metal posts in between. And then we've got a horse fence here. That's that diamond V that uh, wire and they've got those at eight feet that way if a horse runs into it it's not going to shear the, the wire all right so post installation when we're trying to install those plastic posts or wood posts or cedar posts we can dig the post holes the most common method for doing so is going to be using what's called a post hole digger or a post auger now these can be attached to the rear end of a tractor or to a skid steer as we see here in the middle um, if that you are digging post holes, this is typically going to be a two-man job. One person is going to make sure that this auger is level, and the other person is going to be on the tractor operating the power takeoff and the lift to lower that implement down as the, uh, the post hole is being dug into the ground. Um, they're dangerous. This shaft rotates at 540 RPMs. So a lot of people get lazy when they're out by uh, these particular uh, or, or during this process. You cannot do that, guys. You've got to be on your game if that you're using a post hole digger. I prefer to auger post holes with a skid steer. That way you can adjust them um, and you can watch and see if that auger is running true. You also have this weight of this whole bucket lift arm system going down on that uh, that post, so if that you're into some tree roots or some small rocks, um, that you kind of just choose right through them. But not everybody has access to a skid steer, so we resort to the tractor mounted post hole digger. And if that all else fails, we've got our good old hand diggers. Some people call these clamshells because when you look at the end of them, it looks like a clamshell. Uh, they work well. I put in a lot of posts with one of those. Um, you know, it's, they're tiring, but they are functional. So depending upon the size of the job, you're going to have to decide what's best. When we dig post holes, we'll probably want to have this tool handy. It's called a tamping bar. A tamping bar um, has this round, this bar weighs about 40 to 50 pounds. It's about six to seven feet long, and it's got a round disc on the end that's welded. It's about three inches in diameter. 
Um, and on the other end, there's this wedge shaped rock chipper. So when we, if we dig post holes, when we set those posts in the ground, we're going to have to make sure that they're in the ground securely. So we have to put that soil back in and then we have to tamp that soil in around there. We use this tamping bar to pack that soil in around the base of the post. If you, that still doesn't make sense, well, let's watch this guy do it. So he's actually using uh, old railroad ties, which are the boards that the train tracks sit on. And he puts a little soil in and then he just works that soil around it. So he's going to kick some more dirt in and he's going to tamp it down. It's a slow process. There's no two ways about it. Um, but this is how a lot of the fence was installed for hundreds of years. Some people also call this a um, iron digger because of that wood wedge on the end. It's used to just break rocks, cut roots. So tamping bar, iron digger, depending upon what you're using it for, you might hear um, either name. They're synonyms for one another. We've kind of transitioned into uh, away from digging post holes and driving posts. There are lots of different drivers out there. We've got this tractor. Um, type here that's mounted to the three-point hitch of the tractor and you just drive forward and you find where you want your post and then you drive it in and it's got um, vertical adjustments it's got horizontal adjustments if you're not right on the mark um, and it uses the hydraulic system and a weight to just tap these posts in um, there's also a pull type now that can be pulled with an atv a pickup truck a tractor that way you don't have to mess around with the three-point hitch system on the tractor. It's got a small Honda engine on this uh, particular one, and it pumps hydraulic fluid to the pump, and it just taps the post down. They're really, really handy. Our conservation district, as well as John Deere, rents these out. They're $180 a day, or at least they were the last time that I rented one. They might be as much as $200. Um, some districts in Kentucky, I think Lincoln County has one, they rent theirs for 150 a day. If that, you have everything laid out, your post holes marked, all or your post uh, locations marked and all of that, you can really put in a lot of fence fast with one of these. If that you're trying to set it up and you go rent one and you're setting it up as you've got it rented, you're gonna lose time. So uh, I know some, I personally have put in, you know, a good, 2,000 feet of posts with one of these because we had all the posts laid out, we had our locations marked, and we were ready to go. When it comes to post installation, um, there is no just eyeballing it unless you don't care what it looks like. So, again, I'm going to move my camera here. Um, the most common method for aligning posts is to set your end posts, and we'll talk about setting those tomorrow. Um, and then run a string, and that string helps serve as a mark. Uh, this particular person has put wood blocks on here to make sure the transition looks good on the post, but this guy here, he's just using that string uh, as the, the marker for where that f post face butts up against. Having worked for a fencing crew, a lot of times string gets hung up on grass or if it's windy, it'll move on you and you can get uh, out of alignment pretty quick, pretty fast. So what we always did is installed our end posts and then we would put one strand of barbed wire out there and that barbed wire when pulled tight typically doesn't move much and you can use it um, as your mark for those particular posts. Now. If you're putting in horse fence, rail fence, you're not gonna need barbed wire. The advantage to the barbed wire with cattle fence, most of the time around here, we're going to move it up on top of the woven wire just to keep cows from rubbing their neck on, on that fence wire. So uh, that's an option. It's something to think about. If you're ever in that situation, you're gonna run some fence out. When we talk about those T-posts, most of the time, we're gonna hand drive those in. You do have to be careful. Those T posts are going to be about seven feet tall, and as we are seven to eight feet tall, and as we drive them in, they're going to work down to about that five and a half, six foot high mark. Um, that post driver weighs about 30 pounds, and if it's over your head 
and it's hot and you're getting a little worn out, um, especially if the soil's dry, that 30 pound weight over your head can come back and whack you pretty easily. So you've got to be careful. I've seen some, some bad wrecks of guys who have um, just been worn down, uh, tired, and they pull that post driver off and they clunk themselves in the head. And um, it just, it, it winds up splitting their scalp and they have to get stitches and it's not good. So you've got to be aware of that. Uh, with these pull tight post drivers, the hydraulic ones, um, you can actually just use those now. You don't even have to. Most of the time, those pile drive. So we use the momentum of that weight to gradually drive those posts in. But with a T post, it's such a small surface area, you can just go and they go right in the ground. So, anyway. Um, we're going to stop there for today. I want you to circle back to those questions that are posted up and into those nine for me. Um, and we'll kind of move forward with actually setting up posts and, and laying out fence tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, get back to you via email as quick as possible. We'll see you in the morning, guys.